Hey, what's up, Fisher people? So today, we got a lot to cover. We're going to talk about breaking down water on a new lake and especially a super big body of water that you may not be familiar with, okay? The first thing that I want to let you know about is that this is my approach. This is the way I look at it. A lot of people are going to look at it differently. The main goal of what we're trying to do here in this process is basically just put the odds in our favor to catch the most fish possible by eliminating water that we don't think is going to hold fish. So there's this kind of uh, rule of thumb in fishing that's called the 80-20 rule, which says that 80% of the fish basically swim in 20% of the water. So what we're trying to do is get rid of that other 80% of the water that we don't need to spend time looking at. Nothing's ever set in stone. Fish adapt, fish are flexible, they're living beings, they change and they do things we don't expect them to do. So you always need to have a backup plan, but these are hopefully good starting points and things to think about out in the water to again, put the odds in your favor. And I'll also just say there's a reason why professional fishing tournaments give the, the contestants three to five days to pre-fish a lake before the tournament starts because it takes time to find a pattern and to find fish. I guess in one sense, that's just kind of an expectation setter to say, look, if you're going out to a new trip, a new body of water, don't expect to always just show up and dump your boat in and start hammering fish because you're probably going to set yourself up for disappointment. No rules are hard and fast. And even if you're doing everything by the book, you know, sometimes you're still going to struggle, but you're trying to put the odds in your favor. So basically the way I look at this is, okay, first of all, there's a handful of things that are just sort of classic walleye behavior things. You just have to understand the walleye. So what are classic structures that walleye gravitate towards? Classic walleye patterns. If, if you know anything about walleye, you know that points are very popular with walleyes. You know that drop-offs are very popular. Shelves, rocks and rock reefs pumps and saddles, um, but you're also going to find, you know, sometimes fish aren't necessarily tied to structure and they might be more in a wandering or migrating mode and you might find them on sprawling mud flats and sand flats and things like that. You might even just find them on various contour lines along the shore, so not specific drop, but maybe you've got a big shoreline that has a very distinct sort of like contour break line around the perimeter and they're just gonna be cruising those contour lines. Maybe you're on a reservoir where there's a river channel and they might be cruising that river channel if they're in a migration mode. The walleye, like any other fish, is always trying to kind of satisfy that equation of, I want to find food to give me energy without having to expend too much of it. So if it's, if it's in the middle of the summer where the metabolism's high, they're willing to move a lot more and you might find them in more open basin, flat sort of areas, and if it's, colder periods, getting into late fall and into the winter. They're probably hunkering down more on steep, tight, consolidated structures where they have a little bit of everything right next to them and they don't have to expend a lot of energy to find the things that they want to find, food included. And that's kind of important here is um, the concept of transition zones. You may hear people talk about fishing the hard, soft bottom transitions or any other kind of transition. I mean, anytime you could find soft mud that transitions to hard rock, or weeds that transition to rock and or shallow that transitions to steep deep water like anytime you get a cluster of those things in one spot where the fish has access to deep water shallow water soft bottom hard bottom weed cover timber that's going to be a fish concentrator so it's not to say that all the fish are going to be there but there's plenty of fish that are going to want those things in a tight area um, and, if, and if you find that sort of spot in conjunction with what else you're looking for that tends to be a very high percentage area. Also another thing that people tend to overlook sometimes for walleyes is, is the weeds, the shallow weeds. Walleyes are often thought of as a deeper fish and kind of a, a rock based fish but especially big walleyes and especially early in the season like in the spring when the new weed growth first starts, weeds can be an overlooked habitat for really good walleye fishing. So. It can be harder to find them and harder to mark them sometimes unless you're using side imaging very well, but it can be an overlooked spot. And, and, it, and another thing to notice, at any given point during the season, 
there's gonna be fish in multiple locations. There's gonna be fish deep, shallow. There's gonna be fish in weeds versus mud and rock. So there's a handful of different patterns you could be fishing at any given time. But again, you know, try to zero in on a certain pattern that you found and put the odds in your favor. And if, you know, if it's a lake that just doesn't have a lot of weeds, then it's hard to find weed fish, but there's plenty of fish out deep on the break lines. Go fish the break lines if that's what, you know, is working and it's easiest to find the fish for you on that given day. Okay, so with that said, now you kind of have a general understanding of what the walleye do and what they're looking for. Then I tend to overlay that with what I would call like daily and seasonal variables, right? So, is it spring, summer, or fall? You know, what's the weather like? What's the water temperature? What's the wind doing? So the walleye are going to want to be looking for those sorts of familiar structure points for feeding and or spawning activity within the parameters of what the daily or seasonal variables are that day. So let's break this down one at a time. Um, seasons and weather, right? So the big thing with, with seasons has to do with water temperature and or spawning activity, basically. So they're always trying to find a comfortable water temperature zone for them. You know, while I prefer, they're kind of a colder water fish, but they sort of prefer that mid 60s degree temperature if they can find it. So if you're looking at early spring, they're looking for areas so they can find warming water and if you're in the summertime they're looking for areas they can find cooler water and then when it turns into fall as the temps are dropping they're trying to find those areas again where the water temperature is cooling off faster initially and with that seasonality you know, other than finding food the biggest event in a walleye's life is the spawn because they have to procreate and they have to continue the species so when it comes to spawning season in the spring um, you're typically looking at it has to do with the combination of water temperature as well as daily light cycles so they're looking for sort of that upper 40s to low 50 degree temperature to start spawning but if it's a cold spring they're not going to wait forever as the days get longer and longer and longer eventually they're just going to spawn so it's somewhere in that range and when they're doing that spring spawning spots you're going to look for some sort of rock and or pebbly gravelly bottom in fairly shallow water that isn't that has access to current and or moving water, whether it's a frequently windblown shoreline or a stream running into that body of water, something that keeps the water flowing and the oxygen moving. And those are typically going to be your spawning spots in the spring. So shortly before and after spawn, that's where you're going to find a lot of your fish. Water depth is also going to play a big factor here, of course. Um, different times of the year, you know, like I said, it's driven a lot by water temperature, but the, the walleye tend, will tend to relate to certain depths at certain times. So like if you're looking at an overall picture or a map of a lake and you're trying to figure out where to start, if it's early in the spring, you're probably gonna wanna look for areas that have access to shallower water. Where are your shallow bladder bays or your creeks, inlets, and that sort of thing, as opposed to like your big deep basin areas. And the flip side would go into the summer, you know, when you got warming water, those fish are gonna wanna find areas where they have access to deep water. So now you gotta find the deeper basin areas and the main lake and you know they might come up onto some shelves and some slightly shallow spots once in a while to feed but they need to be proximal to that deep water as well this time of year. Uh, water clarity is also a really really big thing especially for the walleye because of how light sensitive they are and the advantages that they have you know with their eyes to be able to stalk prey so that's why you hear a lot about walleye being a night feeding fish um, because yeah somewhat during the day the light of Kind of bothers them and affects their eyes a little bit but it's more than anything the fact that they have a predatory advantage in the evening because they can see better when other fish can't so that's when they choose to go out and hunt because they have that advantage um, so when you're looking for water clarity you want to find kind of that golden locks zone that just right sort of water if something's really really churned up and muddy say you got a lot of rain runoff into a river or a reservoir or you got a massively windblown shoreline and it's just churning it up into chocolate milk that's probably not a good situation. On the flip side, if you get super, super clear water, let's say you're fishing in 12 feet of water and you can literally see the bottom of the lake, you're not gonna have a lot of luck getting walleye there unless maybe it's early in the season and you're pitching way out to them and they are up in that shallow water, but you're gonna wanna find a spot where they probably have some cover and water clarity can be a version of cover for a walleye.
or any other water levels also play a huge part here too. Reservoirs, this is a very big deal because if you got a, if you have a dam, whoever's running the dam, typically the U.S. Corps of Engineers in the case of Missouri River, they can raise and lower depending on how much water they let out. So those things tend to fluctuate a lot. And even some natural lakes, like Devil's Lake is a great example, fluctuate a lot within the season and especially year to year. So um, if you're in a period where you have very high water levels relative to normal, that's typically going to push fish or at least give them the opportunity to go into some of those newly flooded areas and those shallower spots. And they might stay shallower for longer during the year because there's new bug life and new sort of food chain life up there in those spots and new territory to explore. Conversely, if the water levels are lower than normal, as the water comes down, it's going to push them out of those shallower spots. Either they won't be able to get into it at all, or the water's just too shallow to support you know, their, their lifestyle and what they want to do. So it's going to squeeze them back into your, your bigger basin areas and more of your, what used to be your deeper areas, right? And the other thing to pay attention with this too is not only like what's the absolute water levels at the time, but what what is the trend been? So maybe it's like relatively high, but it's down a foot from two weeks ago. Now that it's on the way down, that might be signaling those fish to squeeze out into the main lake and into the middle basins again, so you might want to get out of some of those shallower bay areas at that point in time. Forage base is also a huge determining factor. Again, 90% of a walleye's life is looking for food, and different bait fish and different types of bait depend uh, tend to have different behaviors of where they like to hang out and what water they like to hang out in, right? So, for example, if you have a lake that has a lot of ciscos, aka lake herring, they tend to be a very cold water fish. So spring and fall they might be up shallow, but when it comes summertime they go super deep. And a lot of times if it's a really deep lake that stratifies and you get your thermal climb, we can talk about that some other time, but you'll tend to see those things suspend in that deep water and the walleye's going to be down there chasing them. Um, likewise, you know, they, walleyes will feed on other things, like sometimes there's places that have a good frog bite for walleyes, in which case you'll see a lot of walleye cruising shallow shorelines picking up frogs when they're jumping into the water, which seems more like a bass pattern, but it can be a walleye thing too if that's available to them. Another interesting one from Devil's Lake that we see a lot is, is the white bass. Depending on, again, if the water levels are up, that can make for really good white bass spawns, and the white bass tend to hang out a little shallower anyway. And if you get a lot of little white bass, swimming around you might see the bigger walleyes especially be up shallower chasing those things even in the middle of the summer in 10 to 12 feet of water as opposed to hanging out deeper if you know they're on more of a bait fish or a perch pattern so whatever the forage base is you know if you, if you catch a fish and you clean a couple of fish and maybe you see what's in their mouth maybe they're puking stuff up at your live well or maybe you find it in their bellies when you're cleaning them if you find that they're feeding on something you didn't know about before try to figure out what that forage does and what water temperature hangs out in and what depth tends to hang out in what areas and you may find a new walleye pattern that you didn't know existed before. Another thing I'll tell you about wind and I'll make a special point about wind because it's probably one of the bigger factors for trying to locate fish especially when you're in one of those situations you know where the season's pretty clearly defined and you're on the migration pattern or the seasonal pattern and you kind of got that figured out like say you're definitely in you know the midsummer season and you got the fish pattern there. First of all, wind is huge just because you've got to be safe. If you're on a big body of water and the wind's blowing over 30 mile an hour, it can be dangerous out there and you're not going to be able to control your boat very well anyway. And so yes, you want to fish an area that's got some wind action, you want some wave action, both for light penetration breaks as well as kind of stirring up some of the bait fish and things like that, but it has to be within a reason. Fishing the windswept side is not a hard and fast rule. So if it's blowing 30 mile an hour, maybe you can find spots and instead of the wind blowing straight into shore, it's just kind of quartering into a shore from a certain direction and you're getting a little bit of residual chop there, but it's not a straight shot, right? So that could be even better on those days for fishing conditions anyway, as well as safety and boat control. And I will say that like, we never have a predetermined launch point that day when we put on the water. We are always constantly checking the wind the night before and then the morning of to decide where is it most advantageous to put in A to be safe and B to get access to 
most of the areas that are going to be the most productive fishing because of the way the wind's blowing. So a certain spot might be a really good spot when there's wind and current moving into it, but if it's dead still and stagnant, it might be terrible. So you can't just think of a spot as a good walleye spot without knowing what the conditions are at that spot too. How deep is the water around that spot right now? Are the water levels up or down? Is the wind blowing into it or sideways or not at all? That can change a good spot into a terrible spot in a heartbeat. Another variable to think about that I tend to believe gets overlooked too often is fishing pressure. Uh, in other words, just too many fishermen on a spot. So if, if you get to a spot sometimes and see 50 to 100 boats, especially if it's a shallow spot, they're, either there's not going to be enough fish to go around or they're going to spook those fish and push them off that area. So if you see a bunch of boats in an area, there's a chance that there probably was good fish there, but there may not be any more because they've been pushed off. So I would recommend, if anything, use that to your advantage maybe and fish just on one of the edges of that group and maybe they're pushing their fish in that direction. Oh, I just go completely find a different area because if you got 100 boats in a spot, you might you notice nobody's catching a damn thing. Um, that, the fishing pressure has probably either killed the bite or moved the fish entirely, and you got to go find them somewhere else. So I would always recommend kind of finding your own thing. Uh, maybe try to look for a similar spot to that, unless you're on a super strong migration pattern, um, you know, like where they're pushing into spawn or something, and that's just the only place the fish are, you might have to play bump boats and fight the crowd a little bit, but otherwise try to find your own spot. With these sort of daily and seasonal variables, these are the things that can change, you know, a, a traditional walleye spot, you know, from a great spot into a terrible spot or vice versa. Points are named constantly as like the classic walleye location, but you gotta find the points that A, have the right depth that those fish are in right now, that B, maybe have a little bit of chalk going into them, but not too much. That C, have the right water clarity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So just because it's a point doesn't mean walleye are gonna be there if these other things dictate they should be other places, if that makes sense. Which also kind of points out the fact that like any, any spot could be a good spot on any given day, depending on the way the conditions set up. So you can't always overlook something just because you think that doesn't look walleye-like, it doesn't look fishy. Um, if you're struggling and something's different, you know, sometimes you'll try these spots and they'll work very well for one of these variable reasons that may not be obvious on the surface, but if the water temperature is right, if the forward base is there, and the wind conditions are right, the clarity is right, it might not be a typical spot you think of for walleyes, but based on the conditions that day, it happens to work out for them, and they're there feeding on something. So fish it. At this point, you wanna overlay those two things, right? So you're trying to find those classic walleye structures and fish concentrators that are located within areas that the seasonal daily patterns dictate those walleyes have to be in, right? So, okay, let's say you're fishing in the summertime and the water's starting to warm up and the, uh, the optimal depth for these fish tends to be, say, 20 to 25 feet. Most of the fish you're catching and or marking are in 20 to 25 feet of water. Now what you want to do, and what modern electronics allow us to do so well, is they have this depth level offset feature, or depth level highlight, rather. So you can pick a depth that you want to be at and set a range, plus or minus. So say you pick 23 feet, plus or minus 3 feet. So now it's going to highlight everything from 20 to 26, and the color of your choice, however you set up your system. So now you can look for points and shelves and humps and drop-offs and things like that, transition zones in that depth zone and kind of forget about everything else if that's where you've kind of noted that the walleye are hanging out. Or likewise, when it comes to wind, um, if, if, you're gonna, if you wanna fish the wind-blown shoreline, on a day where you got a good eight, 10 mile an hour breeze, now you can look at just the windblown shorelines in those depths and look for points and reefs and humps and inside and outside turns on that, on that um, side of the lake. 
So this is where all this stuff starts to come together to say, okay, based on the season, this being summer, I know I need to fish a little deeper. Uh, the water temps are warm. Um, the water clarity is not really a concern in the summer. Now you have more life activity. Uh, the water's starting to get a little dingier. You got a lot more algae. So water clarity is not an issue. And if you're fishing deep, it's normally not an issue anyway. Um, so start to find those areas on your map where all that stuff starts to come together. Now in terms of sort of like other miscellaneous stuff, again, as I mentioned in the opening of this, that fish aren't always doing what you expect them to do and or there may be variables that change that you don't know about. Something happened with the weather that the uh, barometric pressure or whatever it is that is changing the pattern and all of a sudden you notice you're not catching fish where you were in the last few days. This is where you have to be flexible and you gotta have backup plans. You gotta have plan A, B, C, D, E, you know, to say, okay, this seems to make sense, but the fish aren't here. So we gotta do something different. There are a lot of days where you stumble upon fish and you don't know why they're there and it doesn't make sense for them to be there, but they are. So if you can't be stubborn, you have to adapt and you have to be willing to move. So hopefully that gives you kind of a general overview of sort of a high level approach that you can kind of use as a starting point when you're at a new place and you're trying to go, you know, there's all this water, there's all these points of interest. Where do I begin? Where do I start? Hopefully this can give you a little bit of a model and maybe a jumping off point, you know, that you can combine with stuff that you know. It's just kind of the things to be aware of out on the water and you're trying to just put odds in your favor and eliminate obvious spots where you probably don't need to look for fish. In the, f in the future in the series here, we'll get a little more into some specific examples of specific lakes and specific seasons and kind of break down some maps and stuff. But for now, I just wanted to give you big picture, the things to think about, the things to keep in your head, and remind you that it's about adapting, it's about getting better at the game, it's about being able to change and keep thinking of these things later on in the water. Also, this, this sort of fish finding game is something that we, you know, we work on all the time and keep constantly revising and perfecting and constantly trying to stay on top of the fish and learning something out of the water every day. So that can be the other answer. If you want some help trying to find some fish, you can just give us a call. We can take you out of the water too. So give that some thought. And uh, hopefully the next time you're out on the water, one way or another with us, with, by yourself, It'll give you a starting point to get on some more fish. Thanks for watching another fishing video. If you liked it, click the button to say so, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more. And if you want to go fishing with us, check us out at bloomdollfishing.com. And if you didn't like the video, I'm sorry. I'll try harder next time. Thank mm -hmm. you.